Ciao, Angela. How are you? Ciao, oh, I'm fine. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay. Thank you Fantastic. so, so very much for doing this. Before I admit everyone into the waiting room, I just wanted to um, to thank you personally for, for doing this. Um, I don't know if you remember meeting me. I, I visited Italy with Darcy from Free Run two years ago. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. in that group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so um, I've been selling your wines ever since then, and um, it's really exciting to be able to introduce you to everybody that has been drinking your wine out here. So fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs> it's, Absolutely. Uh, uh, this year is uh, difficult because we cannot travel and meet people and meet, uh, you know, it, it's nice to show the winery and uh, receive something back from people that taste our wines. So it's nice to make some um, connection like that. Uh, yeah. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but this way you can connect to a bunch of people without having to make the plane trip. And when we finally can travel again, all of these people will want to hop on a plane and come. Yeah, to the exactly. <laughs> I will wait for everybody listening and I will go to visit everybody. <laughs> I love it. Yes, yes. Well, real quick before I start, let everybody in. So what I figured would happen is I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves and just say hello, but then I'm going to put everyone on mute so that it's not distracting. And mm -hmm. we'll have the chat room that they can ask questions. And then I will pick out the questions okay. that, that would work best. That way you don't have to keep up with all of the questions and all of the chat room. I'll do all the moderating and work for you. Does that work? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. And then I also made a slideshow, um, mm -hmm. like a PowerPoint of all the pictures that you gave me. So whenever you're ready to show a picture, um, I'll bring up the slideshow and share that screen with everybody so that they can see them. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and let people into the waiting room if that's okay. Okay, okay, si, si. Great. <laughs> allora, that's the only allora. word I remember. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everybody. A lot of people can't tune in live, but they're going to watch the recording um, later on this weekend because um, yeah. it's Saturday in December. So lots of things going on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you Hello. know, we are uh, seven o'clock. Uh but uh, anyway, there is no problem because uh, yeah. in Italy, in Tuscany, we are closed in our house. So <laughs> yes, the um, um, let's see. Sorry, Angela, can you unmute yourself? I think I just accidentally <laughs> muted you. Oh, that's fancy. Here. Let's see now. Here. Okay. Perfect. Yes, oh, I can hear you now. Um, no. All right, everybody, no. just for the oh, meantime, as y'all are connecting, are if you could. If everyone could mute themselves just for the very beginning so we can get through the introductions, that would be excellent. Uh, there we go. I can figure that out. Um, you can mute them. Yes, yes, now I figured it out. So, um, sorry, some people weren't able to. Okay, perfect. Um, some people are still connecting to audio. So, when they do, we'll, uh, we'll figure it all out. So, mm -hmm. hello, everybody. I think uh, we're still waiting on a few people um, to tune in live, but this way we get all the. Hey, Kara, we're not getting audio if you can hear us. So, we want to do a call check. We can hear you. Are you Drizzy oh, Party yeah. of Six? I, I was, yeah. No. Who are you? Okay. Oh, no. Oh, I see y'all up there. No, nope, I don't. Where are you, Anna? Is your TV volume off? Anna, I just turned, I just muted you. Um, but if you can hear me, that would be great. Um, all right, well, while we figure out all of those kinks and such, um, I'm gonna um, um, just go down one at a time and if y'all want to introduce yourselves. Um, but first I want to make the grand introduction of Angela Franti from Chianti. So she is 
tuning in live from Italy. And so we are so glad uh, to have her here and um, so glad that, uh, that she has given up her Saturday night to hang out with us for a little bit. And uh, we're, we're so excited to meet you and taste your wine. So uh, Angela, thank you so much for coming. Thanks to you. It's uh, a very great pleasure for me to be here with you on Saturday night because uh, I miss you, everybody of you. I miss to speak uh, about uh, my fashion, my work um, and everything. So thanks to give me this occasion. And then, you know, in Italy, we are everybody close uh, in the apartment, in the house. So now I have uh, a lot of friends here in front of me. So it's a different Saturday night. Thank you to give me this kind of uh, uh, a different Saturday. <laughs> so, yeah. And uh, it's a picture uh, or it's a vineyard uh, in the back of Rick and Julie. You see the, the picture? Is a vineyard with the snow or is a picture? Rick and Julie Morrison, I think she's talking with y'all. I had to find my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a picture I took from the Cote Blanc in Champagne and uh, when there was a snow on the ground. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, wonderful. The uh, Forney brothers were hosting us and uh, that's where we were. Huh. Wow. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Well, Rick, since you found your mute button, will you uh, introduce yourselves and if you are familiar with uh, these these particular wines? Rick and Julie Morrison, and no, we're not. We're from Williamsburg, and we're not familiar with your wines, but we certainly are looking forward to it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um, I'm going to go up to you, uh, Gloria and Angela, next. Would y'all mind inter oh, I, oh, sorry, coming back. Would y'all mind introducing yourselves and whether or not you're familiar with these wines or Chianti in general? Sorry, I'm making meatballs in the back for our <laughs> Italian wine. <laughs> um, so I'm Angela, and this is my good friend Gloria, and we do wine tastings together all the time. Um, I am not familiar with these wines. Um, are you, Gloria? Not specifically these, but I did go to Italy and I did um, go to Florence and we were able to tour a winery there and we heard all about Chianti and the rooster and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Awesome. Um, oh, go ahead. No, that's it. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, so glad y'all are tuning in to our second Meet the Winemaker event. Y'all have, have hung out with us for both. Um, let's see. I think I see you, Chris, uh, down there. Um, if you want to introduce yourself um, and where y'all are coming from. It's, it's for me, sorry, because I disagree. Okay. So, um, Sorry, because I was not eating very, very well. And so, um, Chianti, it's a particular region of Tuscany. It's uh, between Siena and Florence. And uh, my family was born in Radha and Chianti. So I'm really connected with uh, my territory. And um, I started to make wines, my own wines, 12, uh, in 2012. Uh, before I had a degree in winemaking and I worked for other wineries. And, but I was working not in Radda, outside of Radda, but uh, I was missing uh, my blood, my territory. I was, uh, there was something that was wrong in me. And uh, before that I started to work with my family. My family had vineyards, but they produce only bulk wine, not bottled wine. So um, we decided to start this new project. I really thanks my family for this opportunity. And uh, we start, first of all, with the Chianti Classico, the entry-level wine. And, uh, uh, and it was, um, I, I was a little bit scary too, because, uh, you know, there is many, many wineries in my territory in Chianti and also in the world. Uh, and so I was a little bit scary 
why, how I can uh, uh, manage this company, this winery, and uh, you know everybody was uh, with a great expectation also uh, about me. <laughs> so you know they work so strongly in their past. They they start from uh, a poor situation. They were farmer in, in when they were child. So they they. I'm sorry, Angela. I'm so sorry. Can you? Um, I I think I accidentally muted you again. I just hit mute all. I'm so sorry. I'm not very good at this Zoom thing. If you could unmute yourself again, I'm so sorry. Hey there. <laughs> sorry. Um, sorry. Not Angela Sheetley. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, great. Now, so uh, from which point? <laughs> when? Um, so you were saying they had great expectations for you going in. Yeah, yeah, because uh, uh, because uh, you know my my uh, the the origin of my family were poor in the past. They were farmers, so they worked so strong in their life uh, to buy some lands for us uh, to to build uh, uh, something that uh, maybe was a risk to start a new project like a winery. You know, when you start a winery, you need uh, it's not like uh, something like uh, of uh, material is some agriculture is something that takes many 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 years so you you start but you you have to imagine in 10 years uh, where where uh, you will be uh, where uh, you want to be uh, so anyway we started uh, and my um, one of the first changes that uh, I did was to convert the winery in organic system because uh, I think my generation is very close to the uh, organic uh, for people that work in our countryside, for people that live in our uh, world and also for people that drink the wine. So for me, it was something of really, really serious. Uh, um, it was like a duty, you know? Not a choice, a duty to do. So, uh, and so we have uh, 20 hectares. They are uh, not in one body vineyards, but split in several parcels. Um, most of them are in Radda territory, but apart also in Gaiole. Gaiole and Radda are part of uh, the, um, is in the heart of Chianti. So it's uh, the one of the historical part of Chianti and also one of the highest part of Chianti. So the average of our vineyard is uh, about 500 meter. It's, it's a lot. So the Chianti go from uh, 150 to 700 meter of altitude, but 700 there are no vineyard maybe just one but not of red uh, grape varieties so 500 is a very high average for uh, uh, Radda and Chianti in, in general and uh, so we start in 2012 with the first label that um, uh, to be honest was the 2009 because uh, my fa we started two years before I was not working completely in my winery at that time uh, but we started with a very small, small quantity, uh, 3,000 3, bottles uh, of uh, Chianti Classico. But for me, the first uh, uh, vintage is uh, the 2012, because it was the year that I worked completely. Uh, I started to manage completely the, the winery. And uh, in the same uh, summer, because 2012 was a very, very hot and dry summer and I was walking in our vineyard. They are so deep, so uh, deep, steep, <laughs> pendenti, deep, so yeah. steep that uh, was August and I need to drink water or something of fresh that was refreshing me. Uh, I decided to start to make also a rosé wine because I said, okay, I love the red wine, I love the Sangiovese, but we need also something to drink very easily, very taken from the fridge and uh, real, uh, just to have uh, an aperitif um, if you have a swimming pool in a swimming pool uh, <laughs> or with, uh, I don't know, something of easy and drink in large quantity in the summer. 
and uh, and so I decided to to to, to produce this uh, rosato. Um, but I had no experience with rosé, so for me it was uh, a new challenge again. And uh, I took inspiration from a friend of mine that uh, produced rosé. So I asked to everybody, ah, how are you making your rosé? Because I like so much, but the territory were different. So uh, I tried to take the best from different uh, producers and, and to do mine. Because uh, there is many, many winery also in Tuscany that now are producing rosé wine, but there is not uh, a style. Uh, a real style. Everybody's doing that as uh, they, um, they taste or they... Um, so so my, my rosé wine want to be a wine, uh, as uh, I was thinking that day in the vineyard, uh, a wine very fresh and drinkable. Uh, so the acidity of Radha help us in this, uh, in, in, in this way because um, Usually, I don't know if you used to speak about acidity and everything, but the, the average acidity of our red is six. So for the rosé wine, it is either. And uh, I want to say that is not rich in alcohol, not so much rich in alcohol because I want to be easy to drink, but uh, a rosé that is uh, with uh, a very flower and fresh uh, smell. And uh, so I don't know if everybody of you know the rosé, but um, if, 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 you, if you know it, uh, let me know how do you feel with it. Uh, even if it's, a, it's not my main product, of course, my main product is the Chianti Classico. So. Awesome. Well, I think most people have the rosé and you should be sipping on it now. By the okay. way, while I um, can, if you're pouring all three of your Chianti, um, the single vineyard Chianti, so we'll taste side by side, Go ahead and maybe pour those in your glasses if they haven't been decanting or something like that. If they've been decanting, you're good. But we're going to try all three of those next. Um, and now okay. that we're all, uh, I think everyone's all signed on now. So some people might have missed a little bit of the intro, but we'll uh, we'll make sure that that gets all recorded and, and up online if you've missed anything at the beginning. So sorry about any technical snafus earlier. But Yes, if you've got the rosé in your glass, please tell us what you think. I love that you uh, were just hot and thirsty working out in the farm, basically farming, and um, needed something refreshing to drink. I love that that was the inspiration of creating your rosé. What year was the first vintage of your rosé? 2012. Okay. The first so, one. But at the beginning, it was not so good like now <laughs> because I need experience and it was a small, small production. And uh, at the beginning, I was not using the um, self enclosure, only the, um, the I, I use it also for Rosé de Cork. Uh, but uh, the year later, I preferred to use uh, the self enclosure that uh, in Italy is not very well uh, appreciated. But I'm a really great fan of, of that because uh, especially for this kind of wine, it maintained the wine so fresh for a long time. And also I can use less sulfite inside the wine because uh, it, there is no evolution in, in the bottle. So, uh, and also it's really practical because you can put in the frigo, in the fridge uh, in horizontal position if you open and you can reclose the very, very easily and um, so I, um, anyway also at the beginning I try to do a rosé very dry because uh, I like it uh, dry in my mind but uh, after some years I was not able to completely finish the, the alcoholic fermentation and uh, I was not happy about that but uh, uh, it was better at the end, because uh, two, gra two grains, so it, it's not uh, a lot, but two, three grains of sugar residual, um, they um, balance the grit acidity. So it's uh, more, uh, there is more, more uh, equilibrium and uh, it's better now. So yeah, so 2000, awesome. and now I'm producing 10,000 bottles about this wine. See. Mm. So um, all of this, it has, has it always been 100% Sangiovese, your rosé? Yes. Okay. I, I, col I collect the grape uh, 
uh, two weeks before the regular harvest for red wine. So because the acidity in this case is higher and also the sugar is lower. And um, there is a short maceration on the skin, about six hours. And then the alcoholic fermentation is very slow because it's at a low temperature, 16 um, degree maximum. Okay. Centigrade, I don't know in Fahrenheit, I'm sorry. That's right. We're, um, um, and just to do a little bit of conversion earlier, she talked about her, her whole estate, all of the vineyards together, about 20 hectares. So it's less than 50 acres total for um, those of you who don't live in Europe. Um, and um, so, but a collection of different vineyards. Um, can I pull up the map now of your different vineyards? So everyone yeah, can see? Yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Let's see, I'm gonna be sharing the screen with y'all now so you can see um, the map here. Um, so this right here is a picture I took of Angela when I was in Italy a couple years ago. And um, so- Yes, um, I was younger. <laughs> not at all, you look younger now. This is, um, it was so hard to take a picture of you, Angela, because you, you talk like this and you're very, you're very <laughs> engaging. And so every picture I had was your hands out like this and it was kind of blurry. But I love that about you. No, that's amazing. I think that that is, that is so, that speaks so highly of your passion for your subject. So um, here is the, just the, what you were talked about at the very beginning of where, yeah. where we are in, um, in um, uh, Siena within Tuscany. And here, if you want to talk about this, um, we've got the, can, hopefully everyone can see this screen here of the um, Rada in Chianti is the actual village. And then the three, the vineyard sites are in uh, that fuchsia coloring spread throughout. So um, can you tell us, have you been farming all of these vineyards since the very beginning, like 2012, your first vintage, or have they uh, grown? Yes, but uh, the Cavarchione Antibuca and also Le Noce, so the part uh, that is in Gaiole was not productive. So we managed, they, they were planted, just planted. So you have to manage since the beginning. Casanova dell'Aia and Isine, that uh, they are in uh, Raddanchianti. Um, uh, they were planted before. Istine was planted in 2002, and Casanova de Laia was the first vineyard that uh, my family bought. Uh, and uh, when I started, the vineyard was um, of the 94, but recently we, we replanted, apart in 2014 and apart in 2018. So, because uh, I I would like to produce a, a single vineyard from that vineyard, so we decided to replant it in two different moments. And uh, the grapes for, for the Rosato, the Rosé, are coming uh, mostly from Cavarchione, which is our lowest vineyard, 420 meters, so it's uh, a vineyard that is height for our Chianti Classico, but for us is uh, one of the low, the low, sorry, the lowest. And uh, it's also the most productive vineyard. So we, when we collect the grape is like to make uh, um, uh, a selection of, uh, of the grape where the, the vine is too full of grapes. So we take out, uh, and uh, the grapes are perfect for, for the rosé and the grapes that uh, remain on the vine uh, will measure better for the red wine. Yeah. So and, you do your first pass at harvest and basically instead of clipping and dropping the grapes, you exactly. actually use those grapes to make the rosé. Yeah, exactly. Cool. See, si, see. Si. Uh, of course, uh, there is, so perhaps in Cavarchione we have uh, three different harvests. So uh, before of these three different selection, we, we probably we passed like this year to cut down some grapes to leave on the vine the perfect uh, grapes. Uh, then we came uh, to take the grapes for rosé, and then we go to take the second choice of the grape, uh, and then the first choice for the single vineyard and reserva. Uh, it's an art work, it's a manual work, uh, and uh, my people that work with me are uh, 
very good employee. Uh, they because it's really important that uh, choice the grape that uh, makes sense to choice. So and it's not so. Um, uh, it, it, it seems easy speaking, but it's not so easy. And uh, so if we have uh, good wines in the cellar, it's also thanks to them that choice, the right grapes in the countryside. And um, uh, for rosé wine, we take also the, the grapes of the young vine. So perhaps appear the, the first uh, harvest of a, vine, a vineyard that, uh, the, the, you know, the vine are very young, so not homogeneous and uh, so like so. Then for the Chianti Classico, as you know, we collect the grape from all the vineyards. So we, we pass, the, so for the second choice, so it's not a second choice because the quality is high anyway, but it's like, I, I, I call it a second choice. And uh, anyway, even if they are coming from different lands, we collect everything and we maintain separated in the cellar. So we have many, many tanks. Uh, with uh, different parcel and uh, it's um, more, more usual for Burgundy or for Piedmont than for Chianti Classico <laughs> as a way to work. And, and so we keep separated. So we have perhaps, uh, I don't know, a different uh, tank with uh, perhaps Casanova de Laia first, second and uh, third. Uh, according to the part of the vineyard, according to the quality of the grapes. So we keep everything separated. It's all Sangiovese. So we have many, many things of different Sangiovese because of different vineyards. And then um, we age the wine for one year in large barrel. And also the aging in the large barrel is separated vineyard by vineyard. And we put together just one month before the, the bottling of the wine. And um, I chose- that's a, Just real quick, that's how large the barrel is. So um, they're about four and a half feet tall and wide. So those are the Slovenian oak casks that were in the winery for this picture that I have right here. So um, um, are you yeah. still using about that size? Because I know you had some larger um, tanks too, yeah. like 20 hectoliters. The larger is 40 hectoliter, 4,000 okay. liter. Uh, so this in the picture is the smallest that we have, 10, 10 um, hectoliter. Uh, it was uh, probably the first or the second barrel that we bought because uh, I'm, continue, I, I'm, I'm still uh, producing some bulk wine because I'm not able to produce everything in the bottle at this moment. So every year I, I'm improving the production of the bottled wine according to the wood that I'm able to buy. And uh, I also... Um, uh, I want to play with the age of the uh, of the food. I, want, I don't want to have the wood of the same age in the cellar. Anyway, uh, every year I'm buying new new um, or one year yes, one year not a new barrel. And uh, to be honest, much bigger is uh, much. I love it. <laughs> So we have uh, from 10, the oldest to 40, the youngest <laughs> barrel. And uh, they are from Rovere di Slavonia or um, Rover, uh, Aust uh, Austrian Rovere too. Austrian so, as well, okay. Yeah. Mm -mm. Wonderful. Um, yeah, everyone was surprised um, or some people are surprised that um, it's not just French and American oak. And so talking about exactly. this Slovenian oak that is used so prevalently and Hungarian oak, Austrian oak and, and everything else. There's so many different types. Um, I love that your wines always taste like Sangiovese. They don't taste like oak. Um, and so exactly. I appreciate the intensity of which you focus on the right oak to use in the right size. Um, yeah. We had a question here about the vineyards. Um, if you could elaborate the total distance between these vineyards. I remember driving, I think it was about like a 25, <laughs> 20 minute drive maybe, but it was a lot of mountains and stuff. What is the distance? How far apart are these vineyards? Okay. And what's the size of the actual vineyards, each one? Okay, uh, um, I was to say um, directly, uh, if you, 
put a line is like four or five kilometers, but uh, driving is uh, 14, uh, 15 uh, kilometers, so 20 minutes by car. With the tractors, more. <laughs> so <laughs> there is a lot of carvings, you know, and um, yeah, it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, like flat, it's on a hill, like a mountain. So uh, when you move from a vineyard to another vineyard, you have different situation, different facing, different altitude. The soil is similar, but not the same, of course. So the main uh, soil that you find is Alberese and Galestro. So mix it in different percentages. And, um, but the altitude and the facing, and also what there is around a vineyard is really important. Perhaps uh, Vigna Istine, which is the highest wine, is a uh, 550 meter of elevation, is also facing north, north, northwest, and is completely surrounded by the forest. So there is a special microclimate. There is no vineyard, no villas, nothing around. Uh, it's very, very wild. It's, um, it's magic. It's magic. Uh, it's also wonderful because you can see Radha and Chianti from the top of the hill and Panzano and Chianti from the other side. So it's a beautiful landscape. For this reason, we decide to call it to the winery Istine because uh, here we have also our tasting room. So if you come to visit me, you I will guess you there. And um, uh, and it's very steep and rocky, really rocky. So it's a very difficult vineyard to manage, but I really love it. Casanova de Laia, as I told you, was the first vineyard that we bought, uh, and it was really close to our house. So it's really close to the village of Rada, as you can see from the map. And uh, so there is less forest around, even if the territory of Rada of, um, of Radda and Chianti is 80% is forest, so um, it, it's site and forest, but around this vineyard there is not so much forest like in Istine, and there is also other winery around uh, this vineyard, and uh, uh, it's facing south, and uh, there is, of course, uh, as in Istine, Galestro and Alberese, but also clay, so it's more smooth a soil, uh, respect the other. Um, Cavarchione. Real quick, it's... can I just interject real quick? Let's go ahead and um, pour those. If everyone has the three single vineyard Sangioveses, I'd love yeah, to, while you course. talk about these vineyards, then we can start tasting the wines from them. I'm going to recommend that people pour from like left to right or first um, the Cavarchione. Um, I don't say it as well as Angela does. Um, the Casanova dell'Aia. Uh, and then the East in a last. Um, so we can kind of try the lowest vineyard up to the highest. Would you say that that would be okay, Angela? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. It's wonderful. my way to pour the wine, so it's perfect. <laughs> okay, excellent. And I'm also going to add one more picture once we get to the East in a, I have some pictures of this rock that's like eight feet tall um, from the vineyards of the East in a vineyards. That's where I took a lot of the pictures. So mm -hmm. um, I'll add that to the uh, chat room so every, everyone can see those pictures as well. Um, so let's let everyone get your noses in the glass of the Cavarchioni while she talks about this vineyard. Um, this is the lowest altitude vineyard, um, but still not a uh, low elevation by any stretch. So 400 meters, um, I think is what you said. And so it's about 1300 feet um, elevation. And that's anything above a thousand feet is pretty much considered a higher elevation vineyard. So. Lowest for her, but definitely not low elevation vineyards. So that's what we're going to talk about first. Take it away, Angela. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's also facing east, and the soil is Galestro and Alberese, but uh, there is uh, uh, more Galestro than in the other vineyards. Uh, it's steep, but it's not so steep like Istine. So it's the opposite of Istine because Istine is faced north, northwest, uh, Cavarchione. So it took the sunset and Cavarchione took uh, the um, uh, sun, sunshine. Sunrise. 
Sunrise. Sunrise. Sunrise, sorry. My English is terrible and without it's traveling. It's better than all of our Italian, oh. so you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this vineyard was planted um, 2009 and 2010, old Sangiovese, and it's incredible because it, it, it's a beautiful vineyard and it's always perfect uh, every year and uh, it, it it's a great surprise also because um, my first prize that I took in my life uh, it was uh, uh, with vintage 2013, so the first harvest, uh, of course, a small selection. Uh, so, you know, the single vineyard, we started to produce the single vineyard in 2012, only with Isin and Casanova de Laia, a very small production. Then 2013, we were able to produce all three. But I was in doubt if to produce Cavarchione or not, because it was the first uh, harvest. And I think maybe it's not serious to put in, in the bottle a single vineyard, a crew, a uh, wine that uh, want to be important uh, with a first vineyard, a first um, harvest. But the wine was so good that uh, I said, OK, I'll put in the bottle, we will see, because maybe in 10 years we will be interesting to taste the first harvest of this vineyard. And uh, with my great surprise, I won my first prize. So I said, oh my God, <laughs> it's a very nice. potential vineyard. And uh, the wine is, is a Sangiovese that is really, uh, you have always the same characteristic. Of course, every vintage is different, but uh, the smell is so balsamic also. Mm -hmm. Even if you have the 17, right, in the glass? Correct. Uh, 17 was a warm vintage, but the wine smell of freshness, uh, smell of flowers, smell of uh, balsamic. Uh, and also, um, when you taste uh, and drink the wine, it's a wine that uh, is, is large, but it's silky. It's not so full body or boring. Uh, it's, uh, it's incredible. And uh, when you open the bottle, you have um, an immediate uh, um, uh, as you say, smell and uh, like a picture and it remain like that. Uh, so it's uh, open mm. and it remain open. And uh, so it, it doesn't go down. And also during the aging in the bottle, I don't know because the first vintage was 2013. So I had not so much experience, <laughs> only seven years of experience. Anyway, the curve of aging is really, 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 really slow. So you can drink this wine in, in 10 years and it will be the same, uh, less or more. So uh, uh, this is Cavarchione. And uh, for all three, the single vineyard, the project for me is uh, first of all, to show the territory through how the Sangiovese. So in the cellar, they make the same wine process. Uh, we keep the best grape uh, coming from each of the single vineyard. And uh, the alcoholic fermentation is in the same uh, um, uh, concrete tanks, so different concrete tanks, but the same, not inox or concrete, concrete tanks. Maximum temperature is 28 uh, degree and the maceration on the skin is quite longer, it's 45, 40 days. Um, we say it, cappello sommerso, I don't know how to translate. So when the skin go down, we put uh, with the wine of the same vineyard in, um, in, in the tank to full the tank uh, and we keep until 40, 45 days of maceration. So it's quite long maceration, very long. Uh, and then uh, uh, the aging is uh, in a 20 hectoliter size barrel. In the future will be in in 30 hectoliter size barrel, but until 2017 is a 20. Robert is the Austria, Austrian, Austrian oak. Mm. Awesome. Um, so do you still have some of your first vintage, the 2013 of this uh, vineyard? Do you still have some of that in your winery? Yes, of course. Uh, I'm trying to make a, a library of my wines, mm -hmm. especially of the single vineyard, because for me, it's important to 
understand uh, the territory and um, uh, and uh, Cavarchione, as I told you, is the wine that um, uh, you can smell the vintage, of course, but uh, it's less um, sensitive uh, to the, it's always perfect, I don't know why, because I'm uh, from Radda in Chianti, so my heart is in Radda, <laughs> this vineyard is in Gaiole, <laughs> sorry, I'm joking, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, uh, but it, it's uh, it's a wine that uh, everybody likes it. So um, even if it's not so, it's not pleasant. It's a it's a it's a wine that needs something to eat. Uh, 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 but it's interesting that, uh, as I told you, tasting different vintage, the the curve of the aging is really really slow. It's uh, it's very good. Yeah. <laughs> So if you were to drink this, um, what would you be eating it with? What would you be your preferred pairing? Oh, this is a difficult question because uh, it depends where uh, you are. So if I'm in Italy, I have some um, food, but um, of course, uh, uh, it depends also on the moment. Uh, of course, the Sangiovese, my... My style of Sangiovese also is a wine is a, something that you can combine with a, a lot of uh, food. How uh, we can say uh, friendly food? No, friendly food friendly. Yeah, food friendly. Yes, and uh, I I suggest to drink the wines eating something because they become better. <laughs> and um, uh, I like it with uh, soup or pasta with uh, ragu or tomato mm. uh, or tomato, but uh, of course uh, the the steak and the uh, the beef uh, is the perfect combination. But if I have to choose uh, with the three single vina, I prefer to eat uh, the um, uh, perhaps pastas with uh, with cavarchione and or cheese, of course, cheese, uh, Italian cheese, uh, seasoned or less seasoned uh, um, cheese. Mm -mm. I love it. And <laughs> do you when? Some some winemakers I talk to don't talk about decanting their wines. They just open it, pour it. They never decant their wines. Do you recommend decanting these wines? Do you think they taste better with air, or do you, when you drink them, you just open and pour? Uh, it depends on, on the wine. Perhaps, as I told you, Cavarchione doesn't need to be decanted, uh, and uh, also Casanova. Vigna Istine uh, probably is the wine that needs much more oxygen to express. Later you will taste it and you will tell me your, your opinion. And, um, but I, I'm not a great fan of the decanter. I think that uh, it's better to open the bottle uh, 50 minutes before uh, and you have the same, uh, the same uh, uh, opening. So, Anyway, I, I, as I told you, they are young wine because uh, we started with 2012, the first vintage. So I don't know in five or six years what will happen to this uh, 2012. At the moment when I opened 2012, really rarely because in my library I have a few bottles 2012, but uh, I have more experience with the Reserva. Um, yes, I, you need oxygen. You need you need uh, a breath, uh, but uh, we can also just open the bottle a while before or in keeping the glass, uh, an open glass uh, and, um, and wait for a while. Mm -hmm. awesome. it's, it's important don't drink it too much uh, warm. So I love it to uh, uh, temperature about uh, 15 or 16 degree. So not 18 or 20. You know, in Italy, some people drink 20 degrees, it's too much. I prefer, uh, <laughs> in your country, you are more able to put the wine to the right temperature. <laughs> we, yes, temperature makes a huge difference because si. maybe not, like for yours as well, because you know, they're lower alcohol content wines. So, so you don't even have to worry about that, but they're such delicate wines. Even though they're Sangiovese and they're they're still kind of a little rustic, 
there's so much beautiful perfumed like floral notes on these wines that you don't get when you serve it at um, too high temperature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Awesome. I have to say, I um, I uh, when I was going to Italy, I was definitely more like in love with Nebbiolo. If I could pick one classic grape of Italy, Nebbiolo was like mm -hmm. my heart and my soul. After my time in Italy, it was about uh, two weeks in Italy, and I was like, no, Sangiovese. I love Sangiovese, <laughs> but like it's got to be done so well. And I think it was after, like I still had my tasting notebook from all of the wines I tasted while I was there. And I, I, I'm looking at a note that says Sangiovese is my new favorite Italian grape. And you just, <laughs> you just sometimes forget about some of the classic varieties um, when you taste a lot of wine. So um, I, I'm glad to see like all of these vintages see their development um, as they have changed uh, since the last time I tried them. Um, can we, the, so I'm gonna go through a couple of the pictures now um, that you gave me. So these, I believe are the vineyards of Cavarchione. Um, if oh, I'm no, not this is Casanova de Laia. Okay, I'm gonna go through, cause there was a lot of This pictures. is Casanova de Laia. You go down. Okay. Casanova de Laia, that's Radda. We'll go uh, back. This is Cavarchione, yes. Okay. This is Great. Cavarchione. So, how steep is the exposition of um, Cavarchione vineyards? Um, you talk about them um, um, oh, facing, um, the are they super steep? It is, it is not super steep like in Mosul, but it's steep. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, I don't know, more than 30 degree, but I, I, I have to say it's like, uh, like so. <laughs> Okay, that's, a, that's pretty steep. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's pretty steep. But sometimes it's more, so yeah. So we have um, recently with a different, uh, with a change of the weather, uh, we have very strong uh, rain in May and April. Uh, so um, it's uh, since the 2013 or 14 that uh, I started to plant um, grass in the vineyard with different seeds. And at the beginning, it was just to give uh, organic to the soil because it was a soil poor. So um, we call it sovescio in Italian. I don't know the translation. And so we, we, we cut the grass and we mix the soil and the grass. But recently in the last uh, three years, I didn't mix with the soil. I just uh, cut uh, because in this way I can avoid the erosion of the mm. strong uh, raining. Yeah, because it's steep and so the rain go down. And uh, so they are soil, not sponges. So also in vintage life 14 that was raining a lot, uh, they don't keep so much water in the soil because there is a lot of rocky, a lot of stone. But um, if it ain't too much, uh, you can have some problem with erosion. So I think it's really important to have grass in the soil, in your vine, vineyard. Yeah. And in you have a lot rockier soils in the Eastern A vineyard um, and we've got more shale and limestone in this one. Is it really rocky? Does that help with the erosion or does all of the rocks kind of go downhill and then you're left with, um, you know, less up, up top? Uh, what happened with the erosion is that uh, you have some uh, long, um, how do you say, uh, hole? What? Like a uh, divot, like a, it, it makes the- Like a dig, a, a, like a, a- A ditch. Yeah, so you have, uh, to go with an excavator, to put all together and to cover and to avoid that. Uh, it can destroy also a line of vineyard perhaps uh, if, uh, of, of course, of course the, the vine, I have the roots. So, but uh, with a very strong erosion, you can have problem because the soil go down, of course. So you have to take something and bring back to the top. So- Would I, I you say, I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Awesome. Would you say that erosion is like the, the biggest environmental problem that you have, or is it maybe too much rain, not enough rain, frost? What other environmental problems are so difficult? 
Ah, in the last uh, vintage, a lot of problems. <laughs> it's nice to be a winemaker because you have a, every year a different problem. <laughs> so you cannot be, <laughs> you, you never uh, bore yourself <laughs> because. Um, so one of, of the biggest problem that we have uh, recently in the summer are uh, more frequent, uh, how to say, hail, hail, hail mm -hmm. ice from the sky. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but it's really difficult to do something with the hail to save your vineyard. Perhaps uh, two years ago, in 2018, uh, in the vineyard Lenosi that you have seen in the map, in the map uh, um, it was August, end of August. I was back from my short holiday summer, <laughs> summer holiday. <laughs> I was back uh, to make- Back when uh, we could take uh, holidays. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and uh, so I was back uh, on Saturday uh, in the night. Uh, there was a very strong hail and uh, the day later I visit all the vineyard to see the situation and Lenoce was completely destroyed. It was like to be in the winter time. So no leaves, no. The grapes were on the vine, but they were completely hurted. And so I lost all the production that year. Oh that my vineyard. gosh. So, mm, yeah. And that's all just from the hail. Just one storm. Mm, yeah. Yeah, wow. and uh, maybe it's one hour, two hours, or 30 minutes. Uh, no, it's never two hours. It's very short. It's 30 minutes, 20 minutes. It's very short. But it's so, you know, stone are really big. Uh, and uh, so, <laughs> so it's dangerous. Um, I, I have to say that uh, to manage a winery with different parcels so far from each other is not easy, but is a form of guarantee of the hail because it's impossible that uh, you take the hail in all your vineyard if they are split. Uh, if you have, if my winery was all together in Lenoci, maybe I lost all my production. So that's very mm. sad. And when, uh, when the hail arrived in the summer, we have uh, a group of producers really connected with a friend of each other. We have uh, small producers. So, and everybody is really anxious to know if uh, Amir of Albert took the hail or not. And, when um, there is the hail, you stay there and you wait until the end and you, you the only thing you can do is hoping that it's not your vineyard. <laughs> that is, uh, yeah, yeah. It is okay. definitely, I mean, people think that, you know, wine seems so glamorous. So winemaking must be this glamorous job and um, talking to winemakers, they're, they're farmers that are just dependent on the weather and, um, and it's a scary business for sure. Um, speaking of farming, I know you are big into organic, or as they call it in Italy, biologic farming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can you talk about why you got into that? We had a question about um, the decline of bee population and, and, and if that's affecting the way the grapes are growing or, or your farming practices. Can you talk about your whole process of organics? Because you are part of a whole co-op of organic winemakers in this area. You're actually the you are the head of this, right? The president or the head of this? No, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Isn't there a, a group of organic winemakers that you are like in charge of or, or part of this group um, of or, or oh, winemakers um, who are committed to organic farming? No, uh, oh, so we had um, a large group of organic producers uh, I think Tuscany is probably one or the first or the second region of uh, organic uh, certificated uh, wine producer. Rad and Chianti, it's um, uh, 67% of the percentage of the vineyard located in Radda are organic certificated. So wow. it's a lot. And Chianti Classico, our appellation, the average is really height 
respect other appellation average is uh, 50% or 40 50% uh, so there is um, a soul in to be organic uh, i think uh, my uncle was the first uh, organic uh, wine producer in Rada to be organic it was uh, 30 30 40 years ago wow. <laughs> Mm, and uh, I, we are really connected also and uh, I think uh, coming back to the problems with the weather uh, if you are organic you have a different way to to fight with uh, everything so you are more sensitive you walk in, in the vineyard every day and you decide what is better for the vineyard to do and you learn uh, from your vineyard how to manage the vineyard so um, also perhaps respect the past we keep uh, um, there was a moment where uh, all the producer taking out the leaf from uh, from uh, like uh, in the picture you can see the the, the 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 grapes are clean around there is no leaf because we take out but in this moment we were very close to the to the harvest so um we we now many of us uh, we we keep the leaf around the grapes because the summer is really hot uh, and so in this way we can protect uh, uh, the grapes uh, with the sh shadow and uh, also the temperature uh, on the grapes is uh, less ice and also the hail a little bit uh, can be um, uh, to say less uh, dangerous than without the leaf so um, we have a group of uh, producers and uh, and uh, we exchange knowledge and experience and uh, yes it's beautiful uh, um, this uh, connection between us yes <laughs> love it mm -hmm. um so this picture right here that's of the Cavarquione vineyard Mm -hmm. This is not how they look anymore. So you you leave more leaves around to protect the berries from getting blistered in the sun. Um. Yes, not uh, in. Uh, so here we take out the leaves. Uh, the, okay. There is not so much leaf on because uh, before the harvest, uh, uh, you know, we collect the grape late, uh, late September, beginning of October. So there is a lot of um, uh, humidity. So before the harvest, we take everything out. Uh, and also because it's easier to, to choose the best grape uh, or not. Uh, and then the hair pass better between the grapes. And so for the disease, uh, you can uh, have less problem with uh, fungus disease. Uh, but um, a kind of viticulture to concentrate the grapes uh, uh, start to taking out the leaves in March, April when the when the leaves are coming out. So they born, uh, they, they are farmed without leaves around the grapes. Uh, yeah. And so, you say some people do that to further concentrate the flavor of the grapes. Yeah, for the right maturation and yeah, it is a different choice of managing okay. the, but um, it depends also on the, on, on the vintage. Perhaps 2014 was a really raining vintage. So of course we take out all the leaves in, in May and June because uh, less leaf there is around the grapes, more hay pass uh, from the grapes, so um, help to dry uh, the water that you have on the grapes. And so you have less risk of uh, uh, disease and also the treatment uh, arrive better on the, on the grapes uh, or, or on when you make the treatment on the on the grapes, of course. So um, it depends. It depends on okay. the weather. So if you are organic, you decide every year a different way to manage your vineyard. You cannot have the same way to manage every year. You have to choose uh, according uh, what the vineyard needs. 
and um, you cannot decide when to make a treatment or not. You have uh, to see what will happen and uh, decide uh, what to use or not. Of course, use um, uh, we can use uh, copper and sulfur, but also we try to use them um, less less possible uh, because uh, so we try to use other uh, like um, something uh, with orange or something uh, with uh, algae propolis uh, something of different but uh, for something um, for peronospora the kappa is necessary and uh, so we have to use it but we try to use the less possible we can and so this is Casanova de Laia, uh, the second single vineyard that you have in the glass and I have in mine too. <laughs> so um, yes, it, I think that's the second in our glass. So um, if you could talk about the difference of this vineyard as we uh, get our noses in this glass, that'd be awesome. And what are those mm. trees in the background? Those, um, I, I don't, are those olive trees? Olive trees, exactly. Okay. So if you will taste my olive oil, it's coming from uh, this land because uh, uh, we planted some olive trees when, uh, when, when my family bought it. Uh, I love olive. It's wow. wow. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, a product, of course, is not our main production. And we have a very small production. But in our style of life, uh, it's really fundamental. And last year, we cannot produce it. So it was a very sad year. We love it. And what happened it, last year that you could not produce it? Uh, because um, not only us, but everybody in Tuscany, there was a very small production because there was uh, a mosquito. A mosquito that... Uh, uh, destroy the production so the the olives were not good so wow so there was um, no production last year of olive oil just uh, a few quantity if uh, you were lucky but um, no uh so casanova um, uh you can see is very bright is uh, 500 meter facing south uh, and uh, for me it's the real radda wine um it's more uh male wine probably <laughs> it's more vigorous more strong there is more tannin and uh, it's curious because uh, even if there is uh, around 100 meter of difference of the altitude between cavarchione and casanova the moment of harvest is very similar, probably because of the facing south and probably because of the clay in the soil. So if you taste it, for me, it's more hurty in the nose than uh, Cavalcione, and but it's fruity, red fruity, and, um, and there is also um, tannin. So it's complex as wine, yes, uh, and uh, it's strong. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this is very good with a steak. If you like uh, bistecca alla fiorentina, it's fantastic <laughs> with bistecca alla fiorentina. That sounds amazing. Um, I love it. Um, question from one of the people is, do the olive trees around affect the grape vines at all in any way in terms of maybe breaking some up of the wind or helping with erosion? Do they help at all in the vineyard? No, um, okay, it's nice to have different kind of culture, of um, agriculture, to have different of something, but uh, in this case, is uh, it, it was, as I told you, was the first vineyard that my family bought, uh, and it was not planted in this direction, it was completely different at the beginning, it was, um, uh, in the past, uh, the, you have the line more far than uh, now. So now there is uh, two meter and a half between a line and the other. So it's a uh, 5,000 vine per hectare. Um, in the past, it was less than uh, 
3,000 vine per hectare at the beginning when, uh, so now it's not allowed to have a so um, low density um, for the appellation. And between a line and another line, there was other um, uh, plants like olive trees or uh, Fruity trees like uh, I don't know, uh, Susina, I to say Susina, like other kind of uh, trees of uh, fruit uh, to have a different uh, because the farmer needs uh, different kind of uh, fruits, not only grapes. Uh, and also in, in, in very old, old vineyard, it's uh, fantastic to see uh, there are some vine that uh, we say the maritate is like a marriage with another trees. So there was not a pole that uh, keep the vine up, but there was a tree that keep the vine up. Mm. So it was a different agriculture. So also we planted some, uh, uh, so my grandfather planted some uh, olive trees uh, between the, the vine, but uh, and also around uh, because we can collect it better. So when we remake the, the vineyard, we take the olives from uh, inside the vine and we put uh, together the other. And um, so it's something of traditional. So I like it. Yeah. And <laughs> almost anywhere you go in the wine world, you see olive trees planted nearby because um, the climate is so similar to make um, great of each. Mm -hmm. I haven't tried your olive oil. I do remember your vermouth and I loved your vermouth. We had it at oh, lunch and uh, that was that was delicious. Hopefully it'll be available uh, one day here. <laughs> yeah, I'm really hope uh, to start to sell my vermouth also in USA soon because um, there are a lot of people that is asking for that because at the moment. Uh, so good. Uh, yeah. And the, the vermouth, uh, it's another <laughs> challenge, another play for me, another joke. And uh, it's made, you know, we started with the Ros our rosato wine. So also the vermouth is a Sangiovese <laughs> product. And it's my connection with Piedmont because I love Nebbiolo and Piedmont. And um, the art of making vermouth is much more Piedmontese, even if there was also in the history some producers of vermouth in Tuscany, in Prato, but uh, so vermouth is Piedmont. So, but uh, it's really nice as product uh, for aperitivo and everything. <laughs> so the idea I love it. that you can taste again. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Can I, I'm going to go through some of these other pictures and if there's anything before we go on to the East Nay vineyard. Um, so those are more of the olive trees. Can you talk to me about the, the yeah. trellising, the rock walls? Yeah, this is, was um, in the past. Um, uh, it was the way to interrupt the erosion uh, uh, and the deepness of, of the vineyard, the terrace. So the terrace are made with uh, stone and uh, alberese stone. And uh, so the farmer put, um, make this terrace to have uh, a flat uh, uh, land and to manage better the, the soil. So, um, in, in, so in the recent past, uh, Many of this kind of terrace were destroyed because uh, there was much more knowledge in making vineyards and uh, with the so when you have terrace they work manually not to be tracked or, or because they uh, so now with the, the right instrument you are able to manage the vineyard in, in another sense but it was a pity to lost so much terrace. And uh, now recently we are um, coming back to the terrace. So perhaps in Istine, uh, my father 
is uh, one year that together a group of uh, employer is uh, to renovate it, the old the, the old old uh, terrace uh, because uh, it's uh, a richness of our territory they are not only beautiful they also uh, have a, a sense uh, probably who built them uh, they didn't study at university they were not engineers or, or I don't know what, but uh, uh, it was much more preserved, the territory, than now, perhaps. So we are uh, renovating them, uh, taking uh, the stone that we have a lot, <laughs> and uh, we are doing back. It's uh, a very expensive uh, project, uh, but uh, we really love uh, to maintain and uh, find the tradition of our past so see yeah. sì. what and is and, and the building in the background ah that is radda is the top of the village where is you radda. are the mayor yeah there is the church and uh, so um, uh so radda is a very small village is a medieval village and uh, uh, so you can see <laughs> it's um, it's like a jewel because it's very small and it's like in the in, in the past so you can see there is uh, the whole of the building are made with the same hole that you have in the terrace so uh, it's uh, it's not new building it, there is much a lot of respect of, of the past and of the landscape. So there is not house yellow or pink or green, but everything is uh, also when people renovate it and repaint, doesn't paint in a strange color. And uh, yeah, it's a very small village. We are 1,500 people living there. Probably in the summer much more, <laughs> but uh, this year, <laughs> 1,000, 1,000 not only in the village, in all the area of Radda, so in the village less, <laughs> yes. probably 700, <laughs> I don't know. It was such a beautiful, quaint village though, um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was such a, I think it was one of my favorite little villages to visit in my entire time there, so it was hmm. beautiful. Um, <laughs> So this is a view from the um, Casanova. Cavarchio. No, this okay. is Cavarchio. I think they are a little bit mixed, probably. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's my fault, <laughs> probably. So, so uh, this is Istine. Let's get into Istine. And if you don't have the Istine poured yet in your glass, go ahead and do that. We're going to compare them all at the end. I promise we'll talk about how they've changed in your glass and the taste for all of these. Hopefully y'all are as surprised as I am just as you continue to taste these wines, how different they are. Same vintage, made the same way, all 100% Sangiovese and wildly different um, in a really beautiful way. So I love the Eastern A pictures because the amount of work that you did to make this a viable vineyard is mind blowing. <laughs> Yeah, it, um, <laughs> it's, um, you know, my family, uh, so I told you they were farm in the past and then they were able to buy vineyard. Why? Because uh, they start to make service to other wineries. So now it's uh, a very um, good uh, company in making vineyards and service uh, in uh, viticulture for other wineries to so make it. And by the time we bought lands for us, um, the first we bought was in front of our house, was Casanova de Laia. Isine, uh, my dad uh, thought was uh, like uh, a good business because it was not so expensive. Before of all, we, we bought the, the forest because uh, my grandfather was a, uh, uh, passionate about uh, forests and everything. And then we bought uh, what was inside, but uh, uh, it was completely abandoned because, because of, it's a very hard vineyard to make and to manage. So if you look all 
the stone that you have there is a uh, it, it's the lowest part so to avoid the steepness uh, uh, we make uh, two big 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 large terraces. Uh, so in two points in uh, on, on the right is the lowest part and then uh, you cannot see but on the left uh, there is another part with a, uh, another height terrace is like uh, 12 meter of uh, of uh, of a height so um, and this is because to avoid the steepness otherwise the tractor cannot work uh, in the vineyard and uh, now can work but it's not easy there is always some problems uh, um, we are lucky because uh, our tractor is uh, very good in managing the tractor but uh, it's not easy and also we have a lot of stone so easy it's easy to broke something the tractor always because the stone uh, are <laughs> it's, it's more difficult than we are when you have a smooth soil and um um i'll say if you look uh, there is a, a very deep forest so it's very wild it's it's like a cake inside the forest also for animals so the animals eat a lot of grapes so we had a very high uh death uh i'll say recinti defense uh, to avoid that the animal enter inside, but it's not so possible. So the production in Istine is always the lowest because uh, because of the soil, because it's a poor soil, but also because uh, it's uh, the most difficult to defend uh, from the animal. And so because it's wild and so it's their house. Um, so as I told you, is north facing this mina, north northwest facing is five uh, five hectares, and uh, we have not only Sangiovese in this vineyard. We planted uh, now recently uh, Canaiolo and Malvasia nera that are indigenous grape variety. But my father planted here in two thousand uh, vintage also San Merlo. So we have also a small production of Merlot. Uh, that is a strange experiment also that wine because it's a very, so probably if you came to visit me, you can taste because it's a small production. It's interesting because you can smell something of Eastern also in an international variety. The Sangiovese of course is more sensitive and uh, this Sangiovese, it's um, something of really complex. Uh, and if you taste the glass, uh, each time that you put your nose in the glass, uh, you always find something of different. Uh, and it's coming and it's coming, it's coming. And, um, and um, it's always every year, it's the vineyard that uh, it's more difficult to manage, but at the end, it's the Sangiovese that for me is more uh, amazing, more uh, particular. Um, after one year of aging, I said, how is possible? So this year is so good, so particular, so uh, complex. And uh, it's more thin than the other. Also, the alcohol always is lower, a little bit lower, and uh, the, the acidity is higher than the other two wines. So probably it's the the, the more fresh, the freshest, uh, also as taste. Uh, um, as I told you, Cavarchione, like to everybody, is uh, probably some people doesn't like it because it's not easy to understand. Uh, but uh, the, the, there are great fans of Vigna Isine also <laughs> a lot. And uh, so you need time, you need to give uh, a breath to the wine and probably you need also more, much more time in the bottle before to be perfect so, uh, yeah, yeah. but I really love it so they're really wonderful ones I remember um that was my favorite that I tried we tried the 2015 mm, yeah and we did barrel samples of the 2016 when I was there so it was really cool to see now this is the third vintage um I've gotten to taste of this one and they're always just stunning wines um, I uh, just put in the chat room, I don't know if you can see it, Angela, but um, uh, you might have to click on it to open it, but it's a picture of one of the guys on our trip 
climbed up on this rock. It's like eight feet tall. And you said you had to dig this up with a tractor to, and, and there was one of many of these rocks that you had to clear out of the vineyard in order to just be able to plant the vines. Um, so when we, when we make the vineyards, so, yes, before you planted them. Let me see if I can put Okay, it there is a picture. If you go on the left, is the third from the hand? Uh, no? Oh, <laughs> fantastic. No? Yeah, there are uh, stones that uh, when we make the vineyard, we found in the soil. Yeah, it's so big. So let's see here. Uh, uh, Tell me what you uh, Exactly. So um, the highest picture is how my father bought and my uncle bought uh, the vineyard. So completely abandoned. So the, the nature coming, there was a vineyard in the past, but it was completely uh, hit from the nature. So the second picture in the, in the middle is how my family worked the soil. So um, I don't know if you are able to see there is um, a terrace in the middle and then uh, down there is the terrace that we saw in the other picture that now you cannot uh, see because there are the top of the trees. And, uh, and then there is, uh, uh, this is a Google hair picture to be honest, is like uh, the vineyard is now. And uh, so it's um, and uh, yeah, here we are on the top of the of the vineyard, and um, at the end, uh, I I don't know there is a, if you can see, but there is a Panzano in Chianti village, which is another fantastic area of production of Chianti Classico. Also, many producers in Panzano are organic, so we are very. Real, really connected as kind of winery around the Panzano and Chianti. <laughs> so, and you can see the forest, how much forest there is in this part of uh, Chianti. Um, this is Sangiovese, great variety, and um, in the picture. And uh, I, it was summer, I don't remember which year was this one of the picture, but I assume it was 17 probably, because I think the soil was really dry, you can see, uh, so, but I'm not sure. <laughs> and, so yeah. if, I, if I wrote down my notes correctly, the Eastern A Vineyard is the highest elevation vineyard in the whole area, correct? Uh, no, no, it's not exact. Uh, there are other vineyards uh, at this elevation, but not so many. There are just few producers that have the vineyard, like so. But perhaps there is um, Lamole, which is um, in another part of Chianti. With, it's a small area of production, but they are at this altitude, perhaps. So um, for me, it's the highest one, but there are others. Not, not so much, it's a very few <laughs> percent in respect to the total production of Chianti. Uh, yeah, but you can have. And uh, recently, because of the weather changing, many wineries are starting to plant uh, higher and higher. So if um, in 2000, it seems to be crazy to plant uh, a vineyard not facing and so high. Now you are lucky if you have. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because vintages continue to get warmer and warmer mm. and you're yeah. staying early and earlier, it's an advantage to have higher elevation vineyards. Um, just mm -hmm. to translate what, um, why, why elevation is so important in this day and age because of global warming and climate change. Um, um, the uh the labeling real quick before um we talked each about each labeling has um the lines um i don't see. have those in front of me because they're outside um but if you've got the bottles right there awesome so that's the <laughs> position of the vineyards if y'all didn't pick up on that yet um so we've got east facing we've got south we've got northwest facing so that's the uh way. yeah at the beginning you want to be yes rational but uh, then uh, even if uh, Perhaps there was uh, Eastern North facing and Casanova South facing, 
and they were too much similar. So uh, Cavarchioni is, is facing, so is real. The other two is uh, abstract. I just want to say different facing, but um, <laughs> otherwise was uh, like that and like that and yeah. too much similar. Well, mm -hmm. I think they're beautiful. And I love that the Reserva is a blend of all three of those. Of the three. Yes, it's a mix of the three single vineyards. So it's a mix of the three labels. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking a lot how to make uh, the lip because uh, the reserva, you know, we take the, the single vineyard for one year in the 20 hectolitre size barrel. They want to be a project to show the territory. So each one of the wine have their own strong personality and identity. The Reserva want to be the best wine, make the best grapes, and the, the best equilibrium, the perfect synthesis of that vintage for the winery. So we take the single vineyard after one year of aging, when we bottle it, them, we chose a match of each to use for the Reserva to obtain the best balance. And then it continue in another year in the barrel and one year in the in the barrel before to be set. So I chose the label uh, with the with the designer <laughs> of the three single vineyard, and then uh, we didn't know how to make the reserva label. And then it was so easy <laughs> because uh, the label explained the wine and the name also. The name of the wine is Le Vigne in Italian. It means the vineyards, so uh, it's easy to explain the wine. When you explain the, the single vineyard and you arrive to the reserva, it's really natural. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else here has much experience with what we call horizontal tastings. So vertical tastings is when you taste the exact same wine, but you taste multiple different vintages. This is what I would call a horizontal tasting of trying three different expressions from the same vintage, um, but of different vineyards. I just think it is such a fascinating uh, example because it's pretty rare that winemakers don't change the way they make the wine because of each vineyard. And so thank you, Angela, so much for making these wines the same way to give us a <laughs> clear picture of like why vineyard specificity, like why the site matters so much, why elevation matters, why soil type matters, um, why drainage matters, um, the, the, the aspect, how it faces the sun, and if you get early light versus later light. Um, this is such a beautiful way to taste these wines side by side. So thank you. <laughs> Grazie, thanks to you. Grazie mille. Um, <laughs> we are, I think the people who have the Reserva, I'm asking them to pour it now. Um, while y'all pour the Reserva, a couple questions um, that, I, that I have been missing in the chat room. I'm so sorry, I'm trying to keep up, but uh, it is hard um, sometimes. So one question was, is there a maximum amount of yield per acre or per hectare that is required by uh, the Chianti Classico region? Do you have to cap your yield, your production at a certain amount of tons per acre? Okay, the, um, is the, the maximum is 75 quintals per hectare of grape. Um, but it's really hard to arrive to this quantity. So, <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, in our territory, if you are in a lowest part, probably you can arrive uh, to this, this uh, quantity because uh, in uh, like uh, San Casciano or Castelnuovo Berardenga, so the Chianti is beautiful because it's different. Uh, so it's the richness of Chianti Classico. Is, is, is the complexity also of the Chianti Classico. So, but in our part of Chianti, the production is not so high. So we never arrived to 75 quintals per hectare. It's really hard. Yeah. And um, if you think to Chianti wine, so not Chianti Classico wine, but Chianti wine that is outside of Chianti Classico territory, uh, they have an either production. I don't remember how much, but I think um, probably 100, but I'm not sure, I don't want to say something that I'm mistaken, but I know that is higher. And they arrived to this quantity. So um, 
for me, it's really important to speak uh, and to say, even if I'm probably boring, I always have to say Chianti Classico. Classico is really important as a word for me because means uh, original. It uh, means uh, that is this territory with this appellation, with this law that is more strictly than uh, outside of Chianti. And uh, many people, when speak, uh, say Chianti. Also my uh, sales or some restaurant, also in Italy, they say, oh, can I have some of your Chianti? I say, no, my wine is not Chianti, it's Chianti Classico. So it's really important, this difference, because there is, they have two different appellations. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think we have to focus <laughs> on classical world. Yeah. And you know, uh, our symbol, the black rooster, which is on the neck of the bottle. Uh, if, I don't know if you can see. <laughs> well, sorry, <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it's really important for us. You can find it on the neck of the bottle or also in the back labels. It depends on, on, on the choice of the producers, but uh, is uh, mandatory for us and we are really proud of it also. And uh, so it's our symbol. You cannot find a wine uh, Chianti, only Chianti or Chianti Rufino, you know, Chianti Pisani or Chianti Senese with the Black Rooster. The Black Rooster is only for Chianti Classico. So just so everyone's clear, so within Chianti, let me see if I can go back up to this vineyard here, or this mm -hmm. map here. Um, there are quite a few different villages. Uh, this is actually um, not a big enough map, but within all of Chianti, there's quite a few villages. Chianti Classico is a smaller region of the best vineyard sites and those original vineyard sites. So you have to be 100% made in Chianti Classico from the approved grape varieties, made the approved way of all of these like very high quality standards in order to be approved of Chianti Classico on your label. Once you get that, you're a DOCG region um, labeling and you can put the rooster on your label, but you can't put that rooster on your label unless you meet all of the quality standards of Canto Classico. So, and there are a lot, um, yes. Um, uh, yes, when I, when I was in Rada, there was all of these little tourists, like little shops and stuff that were selling rooster everything. You could buy rooster coffee mugs and rooster plates and rooster, uh, silverware and rooster everything so they are very proud of the rooster as you, as you should be it's it, it's um as we can tell from the last three wines that we just tasted the location of the vineyard matters so um yeah <laughs> we've it's true it's true <laughs> got the reserva in your glass um i'd love to hear your tasting notes in the comments and can you tell us um angela i'm so sorry we've taken up so much of your time this afternoon but thank you for no don't it, it's a pleasure for me it's a, a saturday night not alone but with people and i love you so <laughs> it's fantastic well, we speak two hours more like you want <laughs> <laughs> we are already planning a trip out to uh, to Italy, I think, um, as soon as we can all travel again. So, um, yes. <laughs> can you tell us how the Reserva is made differently? So we're drinking the 2015 vintage Reserva. What is the blend of your vineyards and um, how long was it aged? Why is this different than the single vineyards? Okay, so as I told you before, there is not the same percentage every year in, in the... Um, in the blend of Reserva. So it's a blend of the of vineyard, not a blend of varieties. Uh, so it's Sangiovese 100% because the single vineyard are uh, Sangiovese 100%. And uh, 2015, uh, it, was, it was a good mix. Uh, so it was a vintage very good. Uh, like 16 also and uh, so the production was good uh, coming from all the three vineyards so Leicester Moore is a one third of each vineyard but probably there is much more Casanova and Listin and then uh, Cavarchione and uh, so um, probably you can recognize Listin and Casanova because they are more healthy than um, 
but you know is the balance is perfect so <laughs> and so much more uh, weight to this wine it's so much more dense and chewy um it feels heavier uh, in your mouth mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah if if you remember you said when you visit me you taste the 15 vintage Probably you can, uh, if you taste slowly, you can find uh, all three characteristics. So probably at the smell, you can find the, the Vigna Issine and Cavarchione. And in the mouth, you can have uh, Cavarchione. And um, you can recognize the uh, character of each single vineyard. But it's really interesting how they are mixed uh, together. <laughs> and see. And this wine was aged for 18 months in oak as well, instead of. Uh, okay, until the 14 vintage. Uh, no, also for 15 vintage, yes, 18 months. Now, from the 16 vintage, are two years. So 24 months in the wood and then one year in the bottle. This is because um, I had, um, uh, for me, the wood was too much new. So it was not new, new but uh, I think it was the right moment to take out from the wood. <laughs> so now the wood is more aged and so we can keep more. Yeah, it is. Uh, a much darker fruit too i think um you said 2017 was a warm vintage in mm -hmm. my head 2015 was like warmer than 2017 but is that correct um yeah 2015 was a warm vintage too but uh, uh the problem in 17 was the rain so there was no rain in 17 so it was not so much uh uh water in the soil 2015 was a little bit better uh, from this point of view uh anyway they were two warm vintage like also the 12 and the 13 uh, so they are similar vintage but uh, i think if you taste wine of the 15 vintage in tuscany you have uh, a night quality similar quality Okay, if it is the 17, it is not always like so. So there are some area of production, they suffered a lot of the surmaturation. Like uh, Montalcino or Maremma or so warmer area because of the soil or because of the, um, our roots in Randa go very down in the soil. So, they always look for water also in other kind of vintage and uh, you know we have the forest the forest help us a lot with the uh, excursion night and day even if it's a warm vintage of course in that vintage 17 was less uh, uh, so there was excursion but not so much like in other year but there was and in other uh, part of uh, Italy and Tuscany, it was very hot also in the night. Uh, and we have humidity, humidity. So um, we have a lot of, of water also. So um, river, small river, I, I don't know how to say. Uh, <laughs> Acqua surgiva <laughs> from the mountain. So, and yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. We, so, we here in Virginia have a lot of humidity too. So we... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it's true it's true <laughs> we understand it when in summer here for grape growing season you can walk out and you just feel like you're you're in a shower it's so humid so um mm -hmm. we feel your pain here in virginia um well i i don't want to take up too much more of your time i do want <laughs> one more key question though which is 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 what i always ask other other winemakers so you have a chance now to tell the whole world something about wine that you are tired of having to like explain over and over and over again or you want everyone to know um you can put anything up on a billboard basically um and you 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 can tell us all one thing what do you need us all to know um 
to everybody in the world. Everybody in the whole world. One thing, One thing on YouTube. Um, all 250 subscribers. <laughs> it's difficult because I speak a lot and so I have many, many things to say. Um, I, I think that um, it's really important to, when you taste the wine, uh, to understand uh, the territory of that wine. Of course, uh, not for me, everybody is speaking about territory now, everybody. Large winery, small winery, big winery, industrial winery. But uh, I think people that, uh, uh, especially about wine, must know the territory. So not only the wine in the glass, uh, but uh, it's really important, the territory. The territory is not uh, make, made by soil and uh, hills, but it's made also by the people who make the territory and live the territory. And so the, the tradition of that territory. So when you drink wine, uh, you have not only a product in a glass, but you have an history in a glass. Uh, and so I think it's really important this. I'm, I am quite, I'm not young, but I'm quite young respect uh, other wineries. So uh, when uh, I taste and drink wines of my territory, um, and you know, I think to the people that work that vineyard for decades and decades, and for me is a uh, really, incredible to think what the man do and uh, i think uh, that man and nature give an important wine and uh, maybe my wine I, I don't know it want to be um a perfect connection with my land uh, with my history and with my past and i hope to show this uh, and that people can appreciate they can be curious to come or to read or to visit on the web and to come in radda and uh, stay with us uh, i don't know i i hope people can be curious and uh, uh, improve their knowledge about uh, our territory and everything so that is such a beautiful way to conclude everything and that was one of the things that struck me most about you and in your family's history you know your grandfather worked as a laborer and then he worked up and and purchased vineyards and equipment and all this stuff and just the hard work and the history that comes with such a connection to land and place but yes it's that marriage of people with the land that makes the wine so wonderful and now that everyone actually knows you and knows the face behind the wine that we're drinking makes it that much more special for us to enjoy. So thank you so much for your time, Angela. Grazie. Thanks so much. Uh, have a good Saturday. Yes, you as well. And um, I look forward to um, seeing you again in person, hopefully very yeah, soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope soon. <laughs> yes, yes, hopefully, hopefully we can all for everybody. <laughs> yes, knock on wood and drink wine and throw the salt. And uh, yes. but the chat room is going a little crazy about planning a trip to Italy, so um, I think it's going to happen uh, very soon. <laughs> when we <laughs> see, 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 see. thank you very much. Um, yeah. if anyone wants to stay online and chat about these wines more, um, I can open it up um, to. Um, well, we can unmute everybody and I can hear your thoughts on the wine. Um, and Angela, you're welcome to stay with us as we chat about these, but I'm sure you have um, things to do on a Saturday. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm at home. So I, I told you there is nothing uh, uh, outside. So I can stay with you if you want. So I can maybe in a while I can take a dinner, but... Uh, Otherwise, I can leave you to talk about my wines without me, and you can enjoy by yourself if you want. If you I think they're just going to be great comments. Does okay. anyone want to, before, um, before we all close out, does anyone, I'll go, um, you can unmute yourself. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these wines. Was there any one of the single vineyards that really struck with you? Was it, okay. was it a, a learning experience to try three vineyards side by side? Maybe like... Uh, raise your hand or something and, and so we can go one by one um but um, Tawana I'm gonna ask you to go first just because I uh 
because you know you're part of you're you're part of every virtual class I've ever done. So if you want to unmute yourself and tell us what you learned about this, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So this is the first class I've done where it's a they're single vineyards from the same general region, same vintage. Like the only variable is the actual vineyard. And so it was really interesting. And my husband kept coming and sneaking tastes while we were doing it. And we both noticed how they were all like very different on the nose, very different on the palate. But even though they were different, there were still a lot of similarities. But um, I really liked the Isteen. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Mostly, I mean, they were all great. Um, I could drink them all, all day long. But the Isteen to me, I felt like it had a lot more complexity. And like every time I came back to it, it had something different to offer both on the nose. and Last the one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, totally, totally, totally agree with you. So Eastin A. Are we pronouncing this correctly, Angela? Eastin A? Eastin A, yes. Okay. Eastin A, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> You're perfect. Great comment there. Um, so Angela and Gloria, y'all had something to say? So the Reserva was the best for us. Yes. Um, the best of all the worlds. Um, <laughs> I actually just opened the bottle for us to have this afternoon. I had Coravin the rest of them. Um, so obviously, and I had fixed meatballs. The Easton Yay actually was very good with meatballs. Um, it was a great food wine, um, but we love the blends. I think just for us, we love blends of, of any kind of vineyard, even the same grape, more than anything. So um, we stuck to our roots and opened this one. For this <laughs> I like the commitment. We're just, yeah, finish that We're up. in it. <laughs> Um, fabulous. I'm so glad y'all liked it. By the way, the, the pricing on there and you get 20% off if you get four more bottles. So um, if anyone wants more of these, um, again, they will age for easily 10 years, like Angela said. Um, super excited. So Anna, did y'all have um, something to say about the wines? I see you just jumped on video for the first time. So We have too much sidebar back here. So. Yeah, like, we're great. Enjoyed it. Love you guys. Carrie, fantastic. Really enjoyed the event. The wine's fantastic. Uh, wine number three, the Istine, um, I think changed the most throughout, which was something that we all enjoyed. But uh, thank you for everyone's time. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. Dominica, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I totally agree with Twana, and um, that was my first thought too. You know, we're talking about like same grapes, same same vintages, and I was just wondering, like, am I gonna actually smell or taste the differences? And it was just really interesting to really see the differences between them. Um, and I actually opened uh, Eastina yesterday, um, yesterday evening, and I've been drinking it uh, up until today and it's really amazing to see you know every few hours was just totally different so very interesting awesome thanks so much for uh your comments uh claudio and uh cynthia did y'all want to say anything hello by the way it's the first time i've seen you on video I oh know. i know we're kind of like i don't know what we're doing with this picture but whatever um <laughs> <laughs> i think we we love that uh ec East and A, we, we love that one, but I think we, we love them all. Great. We love them all, and it was just so interesting to hear from the winemaker how everything came together, and we want to plan a trip to Italy, so hopefully we'll see you. Angela, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah, yes, <laughs> I wait for you. <laughs> Yeah, please do. We're we're coming as soon as the you know as soon as we're all vaccinated, we're coming over. Nonsense is over. Of course, of course. I love it. And lastly, Tony, Jenny, and Keith down there. Did y'all want to say anything? Um, oh, there you go. We couldn't agree on any of the wines. We all like something different, so we're gonna have to buy some of each. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I, I think it's really hard sometimes to focus on the tasting notes while you're doing a virtual class. So you've got to buy more of everything to retry everything, to see what you actually think. So, yeah. Well, Angela, thank you so much again. Thank, thank you, all you for attending this. Um, the video will go up if you want to revisit any of this, if you uh, missed the beginning yeah. or the end or anything like that. And uh, yeah. 
And uh, if you need uh, some information more, you can write me for everybody. No problem. I can answer to you. Okay. So, so um, um, we will definitely like uh, we'll we'll post pictures on, and tag you on uh, Instagram, I'll, I'll, um, and so they can connect with you on that. Is that the best way, or would you prefer email? Okay. Perfect. <laughs> email or Instagram. Ciao, yeah, Bella. Ciao, yeah, Bella. Ciao, oh, ciao. Ciao, ciao. Mille grazie. Prego, ciao.